Hello and welcome to Car Dealer Live. My name is James Batchelor. Thank you very much for joining us for these live broadcasts on the Car Dealer Magazine YouTube channel. Now on the show today, I am delighted to say we have got Lawrence Whitaker, owner of the Lister Motor Company. Hello, Lawrence. Hello, how are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. Delighted to have you on. I've been really looking forward to this. Um, now, for a small bit of background, Lawrence and his father have owned the Lister Motor Company since 2013, but proper petroheads will know of Lister as being one of the greats when it comes to British sports car manufacturing. Uh, now, Lister can trace its roots all the way back to 1890, and for that reason, it can lay claim to being Britain's oldest motor racing company. But it is in the 1950s when the company became truly famous with its Maserati, Bristol, and of course, Jaguar engine sports cars that won countless race victories with drivers like Archie Scott Brown and Sterling Moss at the wheel of Lister models like the wonderfully named Nobly. Now in the 90s, Lister was beloved by those in the British motor motorsport scene as the brutish Lister storm became the darling of British and European GT races. And in road going guys, the storm was even the world's fastest four seater car for 12 years, quite an incredible feat. Now the firm is entering a new era and Lawrence is the man at the helm. Now this is a live show and if you want to put a question to Lawrence feel free to drop it into the comments box and I'll do my best to ask it to him. Now we're going to be on there for the next 20 to 30 minutes. I've got loads of questions to ask him so let's get cracking. Lawrence, uh, 2013, the year you bought the company, um, it doesn't really feel like seven years to me, probably certainly not for you. Um, tell us how buying such a, a famous company came about. It was really like a complete and utter um, accident, to be honest. I mean, my, my dad um, retired around 2008 from our main business, which is uh, warranty wise, doing car warranties. And, uh, and I took over running that. And my dad is a, a real petrol head and a mechanic uh, by trade. And, um, he wanted to restore some, um, you know, old cars in his retirement. Um, and one of the cars that he bought was a knobbly, but all in pieces, you know, a body, a chassis, loads of boxes of stuff. Um, and through restoring that car, it led us on a journey to um, seek out some of the old Lister guys because we needed some blueprints for different parts and we needed different parts making. And it was, it was just purely that journey on um seeking out the company George Lister Engineering which was Brian Lister's grandfather's company which Brian Lister uh, ended up owning um and you know asking them you know what have you got really and they had all sorts of blueprints and they had all sorts of parts and um they had the original books from the 1950s uh, they had the original chassis jigs from the 1950s they had such a plethora of really interesting things that were just shoved up one side of the factory, never been seen since the 1960s at least, um, all dusty. And when we saw all this stuff, we were quite excited, you see. Um, but then, of course, what we didn't realise is all the list of cars IP had been sold to Lawrence Pierce in 1986. So whilst George Lister owned a lot of the old parts, the IP was owned by Lawrence uh, Pierce. Uh, which led us on a journey to meet Lawrence in Portugal. Um, and I'm speeding up, that, that, that whole negotiation took about a year. But eventually we, um, we met Lawrence and his wife, Fiona, in Portugal and, and, and bought the whole thing. So uh, and that was the start of it. It was just a purely coincidental accident. We didn't seek to try and buy a car company. It was just because we, we both love cars. Um, we both have a good understanding of cars. And once we realised this was a car company that had really been dormant since 2006, you know, since the last Storm LMP was made. We thought, well, this is a really great opportunity to uh, to put it back together. Yeah, yeah. And of course, Brian List, you know, sadly not with us anymore, but, um, you know, he, he must have given his blessing to all of this and he must have understood the passion which you and your father had because, you know, it's one thing turning up at an engineering company and saying, look, we need some blueprints for, a, for some parts, but, you know, it's quite another to actually sell a lot of the, you know that 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 part of the company to you, and 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 for for a short period of time, he, he was with you on sort of the, the development program, wasn't he? And on the journey. Yeah, I mean the 
for us, it was really important to have him involved. And uh, I mean, he died in uh, late 2014. So we had him on board for about a year and, um, and, and got to know him really quite well in that time. And, uh, you know, he was a really grand old gentleman, you know, third generation, bow tie every day, super smart, well-spoken, you know, nothing Much like, like you. Much like you. <laughs> <laughs> opposite of me. <laughs> and, uh, but he was, you know, he, he was a really emotional man as well. I mean, he's Archie Scott Brown was the list of the list of famous racing driver in the 50s. And he died in 1958 or nine, I think it was, I think it might have been late 1958 in a, in a Lister. And um, Brian never got over it. And even when he talked to me about it, it you know, um, when I met him, you know, he was still welling up about the loss of Archie. And, and really that's what made him stop building cars was the fact that he didn't really want to go on because he'd lost this driver that was his best friend. But having him on board and I mean, the, Quentin Wilson, who you, you know well, who's helped us uh, through the journey, he took the, um, the first ever Nobly that we finished to Brian's house um, to get Brian's seal of approval. And we did a lovely video around that and, and, and Brian loved the car and he, he died about 10 days after that video was shot. So uh, it was a really sad but poignant end to, you know, to his journey really. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. The last thing he said to me was, just make sure you don't, you know, mess up the company that I've, I've built up. So I said, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll uh, try my best. So uh, that's always on my mind, really, that I need to, uh, you know, have his legacy in, in the back of my mind. Yeah, yeah. And of course, you know, that was, you know, in, in the late 50s and especially during the 60s, that was, you know, a constant problem for, you know, Enzo Ferrari called, you know, you know, we British garage, garage Easters, you know, and Brian Lister was very much part of that, that team of, of people. And, but in contrast to guys like Enzo Ferrari, you know, Brian was, you know, he took the death of Archie Scott Brown very, well, badly, didn't he? And, and you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very different scene to, to, to now, really, isn't it? How motor racing has changed. Oh, exactly. I mean, I mean, there was one person dying every weekend in the 50s and um one racing driver and um you know um i think if brian had been more like uh, other people that you mentioned like enzo ferrari and colin chapman and because he was he was about a decade before colin chapman and one of um, brian's skills was was weight you know he would take the weight completely out of a car so the reason the nobly was so successful was it was basically the same engine as a jaguar d-type same gearbox but it weighed half as much yeah. So, you know, it was, it was through, and when you look at a knobbly and you take the body off, there's, there's, it's like a, a skeletal frame that you can tell that Brian in his time was just thought we need to make this lighter, this lighter. And he was the king of, 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 of weight loss at that time. And I think had he been able to get over Archie's death and, and, and basically got another racing driver in the car, he probably would have carried on to be even more successful than he was. Um, so yeah, in, in a way, he's kind of a victim of his own uh, emotions, but I don't think that's a bad thing. It's uh, yeah. it's, it's a nice uh, part of the story, isn't it? Really? Yeah. And another thing that's different to now is the fact that you know the the, the Nobly um, with its Jaguar D-type engine was sort of if not not sanctioned, but it had sort of the blessing of of William Lyons, didn't it? And and he knew very well that it was beating the D-types. Whereas nowadays, that kind of thing wouldn't really be allowed to happen. It's quite incredible, really. Well, the stories, I mean, it, it wasn't really as, uh, as, as kind of um, straightforward as that really, but um, William Lyons, obviously 1957, the Browns Lane fire destroyed a lot of the Jaguar factory. It destroyed nearly all of his racing cars. Um, and, and William Lyons was really keen to keep, obviously Jaguar, 55, 56, they'd had such a fantastic period of winning races. Um, and he was keen to keep that going. Um, and the story goes that he, he knew Brian from being at the tracks and everything and uh, asked um, Brian, amongst others, if they would take a Jaguar engine and put it in their car. And Brian was really against this. You know, I mean, he, um, he was using a Maserati engine. He was quite pleased with that. You know, he didn't, he, he, they were winning races. He didn't really see the need for the Jaguar engine. Uh, but William Lyons being the canny businessman that he was, he got uh, Shell to uh, to give Brian Lister some sponsorship, which Brian Lister had never had before. So Shell sponsored Lister uh, as long as they got this engine. Yeah. Um, so in the end, um, Brian ended up putting the Jaguar engine in the car. 
Uh, and, and that that was a, a match made in heaven because it was a you know 350 brake horsepower engine. The car weighed 800 kilograms. Um, it was a reliable engine, which the Maserati engine wasn't really. And um, and so that's why they had so much success in the 58, 59 seasons. Um, and pretty much cleaned up. I think in 1958 there was 14 races to the the uh, the British Empire Trophy that year, and they won. Uh, 12 of them I came second in the the 13th and, and pretty much you know won everything there was to win at that, that time yeah and there's a there's a really nice plaque on the wall in the Lister factory that was given to Brian Lister in the 50s by um uh the uh, Aston Martin president at the time uh saying that Lister out of the 2000 races Lister entered in 1958 uh, and 59 they won or finished in a top three and a podium position in 1600 of them so it's like you know the success of it was was huge really compared to other and, and on, a, on a shoestring budget as well yeah yeah and of course you know a key part of their success was attracting top flight drivers and you know archie scott Brown, you know not not many people probably have heard him nowadays but at the time you know he 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 was very well known of course sterling moss as well um and of course it was an era where 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 drivers would be at for instance, Goodwood for a, for a race weekend or a race day, and of course they 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 win one race in in a, in a Nobley or a Costin or something, and then hop into a 250F Maserati or a Cooper in the Grand Prix race, and that kind of you know dual purpose driver is just something that we've lost, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. no, it was it was, and 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 obviously yeah, I mean Sterling Moss raced in in 1958 for Lister as well, and uh, just before he moved to uh, I think uh, Mercedes full time, but. Uh, you know, he, um, uh, he, he remembered Archie really fondly. I think if Archie had survived, you know, he would have become a much more famous driver. I think the fact that, you know, he died in his, I think he was 30 years old when he died. Um, you know, and, it, and it, yes, he, he had a good um, career. And there's a really fantastic book about him called Archie and the Listers. And it's a really great read for anyone who's interested. But um, yeah, I think if, if he'd survived, you know, he would have gone on to be a, a much more famous driver like the likes of Sterling Moss um, uh, became. But, you know, it, at that time, I mean, there was a lot of great drivers that were lost, um, you know, in, in, in that era. It's just, yeah. it just got, like you say, it just goes to show you it wasn't just the cars that were, you know, uh, not as safe. It was the tracks, really. The tracks weren't safe. Um, and it, I think it was Jackie Stewart that kind of got it all into a much better position where the, um, the, they started putting proper barriers up and not racing around where there were loads of trees and things like that and, and using better materials in the car. I mean, the, the listers of 1957 and 58 were all made out of magnesium. So, um, of course, if you crash, it's, you remember magnesium at school, it just yeah. goes up and that's what, that's what happened, unfortunately. Yeah. So the, so the noblies that you're making now, you know, they are, you know, let's, let's, let's not forget they really are properly handmade cars built in the same place where they were originally made with the same tools, quite often with the same people as well. Um, you know, it, that is a remarkable thing. Can you just explain to me what a list of knobbly customer is? Is it, is it, is it very easy to categorise categorize the typical customer? No, no, they're all completely different. Um, some people uh, just want one to put in the garage at home to look at because they think it's a beautiful car. Some people want to go out and race in historic race events. Uh, some people are investors that think they're a good buy. Um, and, so, and some people just want to go to the pub in one, you know, on, on, the, on the weekend. You know, so it's, it's a completely varied group of people who, who buy Nobles. And, 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 and one thing I've been amazed at when, when I, for the first press release I ever sent out for Lister was when we announced the 10 Nobles that we would make. Um, inquiries coming from Russia, Australia, uh, we had one from uh, Nagasaki in Japan, you know, and uh, all America, you know, the, the, it was truly, uh, you know, I didn't realize how globally known the brand was, um, to be honest, uh, you know, <laughs> wrongly probably, but uh, uh, until afterwards that press release went out. And I remember going to Las Vegas and on holiday and I was sat in the um, the, by the pool at the Wynn Hotel and there'd been a massive conference on of surgeons, heart surgeons in America. And this guy came out and uh, sat next to me and I, I said, oh, what do you do? He says, oh, I'm, I'm America's leading heart surgeon. I said, oh, wow, you know, that's 
pretty impressive, isn't it? Talking to him for a while, and he said, "What do you do?" I said, "Oh, I own a small British car company called Lister." He said, "Oh no, Lister, the Lister Storm, and this." And he was so excited about it, and I was like, "God, how do you know about it?" You know, it's just, and that's happened to me in Australia. You know, I mean, it, it is a it is a global brand, and and it's really down to the the, the people who love racing. You know, love the knobbly, love the costing, love the storm, uh, and and on all those races that they won. Mm, yeah. And really, you know, there is this trend now, which I, I don't know whether you're ahead of the curve or you kickstarted it, or you were very much a part of it, of having continuation models or two room copies or call them what you will. But, you know, Jaguar, Aston Martin, they've all recognised that there is this pretty insatiable demand for old continuation cards, isn't there? Because people, perhaps people find um, a certain passion from them, which they don't tend to find from modern cars. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, with, with the continuation cars, I mean, uh, I think, uh, you, I mean, uh, as far as I know, we were, we were kind of the first to announce in, in modern times that we would make a um, continuation car. And um, for us, it was, um, you know, an original Nobly at that time was sort of $2 million when we bought Lister in 2013. So they were far, far out of reach of most people who, who could go racing. And, 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 um, and there was only, you know, there's a, there's a handful of cars that are left, obviously, that are, um, that are what you could consider true original cars. Um, and, um, you know, so making a continuation car for us, we had the jigs, we had the books, we had the, I mean, we brought four guys out of retirement who was in their 80s and 90s who were at the factory in their, uh, in their prime to train our apprentices. And, you know, doing all those things and it seemed obvious to us to make a Nobly continuation car. And, you know, I think what we did was, I mean, over the Nobly continuation um, run of cars, which was 10 race cars, uh, 10 road cars, 10 Sterling Moss cars, and then 10 Costings. Um, I think what we've realized is we, we, we undercharged massively. So we, we went out at 250 250,000 for the first cars. And quickly after we finished the first 10, we realized that we'd lost about a million pounds on those 10 cars. And, uh, and then we saw so we upped the price to 300,000. We lost about uh, 800 grand on those cars. And then, so we, we upped it again. And we're still losing money on, we've never made a penny on any of this, the, the knobbly. So when people, I, I've got that classic uh, saying, you know, can I have a discount? Oh yeah, you can have one for cost price if you like, you know, no problem. Um, uh, it'll be 500 grand, please. But, um, but I think, you know, you're right, Jaguar and Aston Martin and, and Bentley have, have kind of all gone down the continuation route. And it's funny because I think when, when Jaguar did it with the um, uh, E-type lightweights, um, it, it was all fine. And, and now, I mean, I've, I've seen some negative press on the Bentleys and, um, you know, the continuation. So it's, it seems that people have kind of got a bit fed up of continuation cars, really. And, um, you know, we're, we're coming to the end of our production build of our continuation cars that we, I think we've got four left to deliver. And after that, it's, uh, we're not going to do any more continuations. But um, it's been a really good journey and, and, a, and a good way to get the brand alive again and, and, and doing what we do best. But you're right, they're completely handmade in Britain. We, we only use British um, um, parts. We, we, you know, we could save a lot of money by going uh, and having bodies made in, in, in the uh, East European countries. But we, we, we hand make all our bodies in Britain. Um, we, we, so all the parts that we put into the car are British supplied um, and for us that was very important as well to make sure it was a, a British product, handmade um, and, and you know when you see a finished car racing it, it really warms your heart that we've made this thing, you know it's, uh, it's um, I'm really really proud of the cars that we've made uh, you know over the last seven years. Yeah, yeah and so how long do they take to build and how many workers are, are are on it you know it's, it's obviously not production line there are pro you know there are dedicated workers on each car but how long do they the production take? line you know there's like a there's a four car production line you know chassis. Well, when i when i say production <laughs> i don't mean like you know at swindon <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh, but, um, uh, yeah i mean there's uh, at any one time you know we, we we probably only have sort of six to eight people working on the cars um i mean they are really um not a quick build you know if you ordered a nobly well there isn't really any noblies left but there's some costings left so if you ordered a, a costing today um you wouldn't be getting it for at least 18 months 
And, but that's just how long they take. You know, they, they just take a long time to make. I mean, the, the aluminium body of the costin takes around a thousand man hours to produce. Um, it's all hand crafted and, and hand bashed out with hammers and wheels. Um, uh, and, and that's why these things take such a long time. But the customers, even though some customers have had to wait a long time, they've all kind of got involved in coming to the factory, seeing where it's up to, talking about different specs. And I think that's part of the journey and part of what people really like about what we do. Um, you do get involved uh, and, and do want to, you know, come down and, and enjoy the process rather than it just being, there's my deposit, I'll wait till it's ready sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So, um, you no, know, we've, we've been lucky that the customers that we've, we've had have understood that the car takes some time. Yeah. But of course, that's only one part of the business. Isn't it? The other part of the business is, of course, um, you know, taking modern products and giving them the list a touch. So just just give give you as a bit of a an idea of, of the other part of the business. So, I mean, in, in 1986, Lawrence Pierce bought Lister and, and Lister's only had three owners, by the way, you know, Brian Lister, Lawrence Pierce and now me, Lawrence Whitaker. Yeah. Um, and um, there's a lot of Lawrence's in the motor trade, by the way. I'm always coming across <laughs> Lawrence Tomlinson and Janetta. There's loads of them. Um, and, um, you know, but he had a lot of success doing the Jaguar XJS conversions. So um, and they were called the Lister Le Mans. Um, and, um, you know, it just kind of made sense to me. Look, you know, we've got the F-Type, which nobody was really tuning. I mean, there was a few little pieces in Germany, I didn't have done a bit of tuning on them, but no one was really tuning them to any great standard. And I thought, well, you know, there's, there's a real golden opportunity here to reignite this Lister Jaguar kind of tuning range. Um, and, and I thought we'd start with the F-Type and if it went well, we'd do the other cars. And when we um, announced the, uh, the F-Type, which was basically taking a Jaguar F-Type and, and I mean, the, the, we, did, we did three years of development on the first car. So the first, we bought a 2015 F-Type to start working on, and we didn't release the car till 2018. Um, but we did, you know, full new carbon fiber body kit, front bumper, back bumper, uh, diffusers, uh, um, side skirts, full new um, suspension setup, fully adjustable, full new exhaust system that was switchable. Uh, full new, uh, obviously, wheels, full new interior. And so we, we really went through the car in, in, in a quite in-depth kind of way. Um, and, and I'm the sort of person, and I'm sure you are as well, you get in a car and you drive a lot of different cars. And you've always, I, I'm always critiquing the car, even though I'm not a motoring journalist. I'm always thinking, that could be a bit better. That could be a bit better. You know, this, there's a bit of a funny bit on the seat here that's a bit uncomfortable. And, and so I lived with the F-Type for quite a while to kind of, find out all these little pieces that, that were annoying me. And there was some things that annoyed me. You know, I'm, I'm six foot two and the, the back of the headrest was, was nowhere near where my head was. No, no. It it just no. Um, so there were th some things that, that, were, that were bugging me. And, um, and so we, you know, we ended up with a car which was 666 brake horsepower, which we, we, we tuned the, um, the five liter V8 engine up to 666, which was a nice number, you know, and, uh, nice. yeah. um, and then we, um, you know, with all the extra mods and everything that we did, and when, when, when we launched that car on the, uh, uh, to the, uh, uh, you know, with the press release, we didn't, we didn't, we haven't got the big budgets like the car manufacturers have, have got to do big launches, but we just, just sent out a press release. That was pretty much it, to be honest. But we sold 14 cars on the same day that we released it, you know, so we were like, well, this has gone quite well then. Yeah. Um, and um, they were £155,000 each. Um, so the, you know, that represented sort of like a 65,000 pounds increase on the Jaguar. Um, and you know, we, 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 we've kind of done, you know, um, the run of those cars now we're move, moving on to the F, F pace. So we're about to launch the new F pace SVR, which we've obviously taken an F pace SVR done exactly the same thing. I've lived with the car, what needs improving, what could we change? We've, we've done the, the full carbon fiber body kit, new suspension, new exhaust new wheels, new interior. Um, but basically, if it's available to fiddle with, we've fiddled with it um, and, 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 and made a car, which, you know, honestly, I mean, I'm, it's, it's better than the F-Type uh, Jaguar that we did. And it's better than pretty much any other car I've ever driven. You know, it's such a great everyday SUV. You know, I mean, I know a lot of people at the minute buy Range Rover uh, SVRs. But the great thing about the Lister Stealth is that it's slightly smaller, so it's just just nippier. You know, it's it's it handles fantastic. 
it drives really great. It's, it's one of those cars that you get in and you're just quick to set off, you know, and I love those cars. Like I call, I, I call them point to point cars. And you know, I had a, I had an SL63 once and that was the same. You get in it and you could set off really fast and go somewhere fast, get out fast. And it was, there was no messing about with it. There wasn't any kind of like, I've got to lift this button up and press this or it's not starting as fast as I thought it would. And it's just a really, really great everyday usable car. And we've, we've delivered one already to a customer and he's just said it's, um, absolutely you know his favorite car he's ever owned so we, we, we think we've got quite a good product that people will will like and the great thing is the, the they're only costing uh 110 000. so i think when you consider that that 666 brake horsepower um a, a completely bespoke car and when you look at that next to a new range rover spr which is 150 or a lamborghini um oh, uh, which yeah. is 200 you know it's yeah it's looking like pretty good value yeah and, um, you know, it's not that much more expensive than the, the, the base car, the F-Pace SVR. And of course, that car talks to a very different customer base. You know, I'm sure the customers you're talking to are not interested in an SVR product from Jaguar's SVO division. It's, it's talk And of course, let's face it, it is as much as people, there are plenty of people who like to criticise SUVs at the moment. Goodness only knows that I know because I was on a radio show this week where um, I was having to stick up for SUV for people who buy SUVs, but this 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 market for performance SUVs is exploding, isn't it? And you know, people, if, if there's a way of having a car that's a little bit different from from the next door neighbours or the guys down the street, they're going to go for it. So I think you're in the right marketplace at the moment. Yeah, and I think I think the people that buy our cars are people that that they love racing to begin with. They remember Lister from from the great races that Lister have, have won. Um, you know, they you're right they want something they don't want an svr they, they feel like a range rover svr is a bit too crude in a way they want something a little bit more classy a little bit more uh, with, with a, bit, a bit more heritage perhaps and i think with the list of products i mean it can be completely bespoke to the customer's needs i mean there's 36 different color choices of leather there's 90 different color choices of stitching um, you can have any color piping you want you can have any color of car you want. You know, there's literally, if you bring us a color that you like, we'll, we'll make the car that color for you. And, you know, you can go as mad as you like. Um, uh, uh, but at the same time, you're getting something that is, you know, we put all of our passion and, and kind of heritage for Jaguar vehicles into that. And, you know, I mean, the, the product, I mean, not to, I think the Jaguar SVR basic product is good. You know, I think it's... Um, it's a good car to begin with. I think that's why you end up with a, an even better car, really. It's no good starting with something terrible. But, um, you know, the, 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 what you're getting is that bespoke uniqueness that people are always searching for. You know, people, I think these days, there's, there's, there's a lot of similarity between things and there's, there's no kind of differentiation. You know, everyone's got a pair of Ray-Bans, pretty much, you know, and, and, and you know, it, it's those kind of things that, well, you want to be a little bit different. So you might buy a pair of Tom Fords. And that's what a Lister is, you know, you, it, it, it's not for the people who want a Range Rover SVR or, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's for someone who wants to stand out a little bit extra and have something to talk about and something interesting and something that we've put a lot of energy and passion into that we think is a, a great product. Yeah, yeah. So are these cars, gonna, are they going to be limited in number? Yes. So they're limited to, um, originally we were limiting them to 250 cars. Uh, but we've we've reduced that now to a hundred cars, so just one hundred cars. So it's it's going to be pretty limited, really. Yeah, yeah. And of course, uh, you know, as we move to more of a, an electrified future, are you looking at uh, electric cars or some some form of electrification with future listers? Yeah, I mean, we've you know, it's difficult, isn't it? I mean, I've shunned it in the past, and um, you know. It, I still probably don't believe that the future is fully electric. You know, I mean, I, I, I could be wrong. Um, I just think, I still haven't got my head around what, how, you know, I mean, I live in Lancashire and we're, we're most of the towns around me are mill towns. And so, you know, you've got literally hundreds and hundreds of thousands of terraced houses. And how is every single person gonna have an electric car? You know, are we gonna have a wire across the street from their house, across the pavement? Um, you know, are we, is the government really going to invest in, you know, a, a charging point on the side of the road in front of every single person's house? Um, you know, I just find that all that to happen before 2035 is, is a really big ask. Um, 
So, you know, I mean, I, I think they're, you know, if, if, listen, if they come out with a battery that you can charge in five minutes and it does 300 miles, I think, you know, that's probably a good compromise. But I still don't believe that until, until electric technology is better than ICE technology, um, and, I, and I don't see what's wrong with hybrids. I mean, I, I, I think hybrid technology is fantastic. If you can press a button in your car and your car can do 30 miles on electric while you're in the city, and then you leave the city and you press the button and it goes into its engine. I think that's pretty good. You know, it's um, a modern, um, you know, engines are very, very low polluting engines compared to, to the past. Um, so I, 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 it's intriguing. I mean, I think we've looked at um, electric options um, for the new storm uh, that, I've, that I've wanted to produce for quite some time. Um, and I think it's a case of for me, what do the customers want to begin with? And I think like looking at what Gordon Murray's done with the T50, um, you know, that, that is, for me, that's, that stirs my loins a lot more than seeing some new electric <laughs> hypercar that comes out. Yeah. Um, and I think if you are an enthusiast, um, I think still enthusiasts are very much petrol engine driven at the moment. Um, how that technology will change, we'll just have to wait and see, won't we? Well, it's going, it's going to be very interesting, isn't it? Because at the moment, as we know, electric cars, they serve a, a particular purpose for a particular buyer. And at the moment, you know, it's, it's about the vast majority of electric cars on sale at the moment. They're either, you know, premium products like an iPACE or a Tesla or a, you know, EQC or something. Or, you know, they are little shopping cars, you know, or little hatchbacks that are designed to to um, have the most amount of range possible, all this kind of thing. But at the moment, of course, there isn't a properly performance car, which a tuning company or a, you know, a, 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 you know, a sports car company's come in and done an electric car version, you know, done a, 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 you know, a tuned electric car. And moving forwards, that's gonna be the interesting thing, isn't it? Are, are we, is there gonna be a market for those kinds of cars or is there gonna be some kind of loophole in the legislation which will allow companies like Caterham or other British sports car companies still to produce a small number of ICE engine cars or something like that. It's gonna be very interesting to see where people are gonna get their thrills, isn't it? And I think that that, you know, I mean, you would hope that that is logical and seems reasonable. I mean, if companies like Caterham and Janetta and ourselves and and people who make less than sort of, you know, 250 cars a year, um, you know, I don't really see an issue in, in allowing those cars. I mean, we already are blessed with the, you know, less regulation than the big companies have, um, which helps a great deal. I mean, we, we literally couldn't build a car if we had to adhere to the regulations that a big company like Jaguar or Mercedes has to, um, you know, because, I mean, I think to, 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 to have a road car, in the States, or I think it's 16 cars you've got to give over to crash testing. Um, you know, well, how can a company like Lister afford to give 16, 400,000 pound noblies to somebody to, to crash test? You're losing um, enough as it is, let alone crashing them. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, and, and I think that brings you around to, I mean, I, I, I treat Lister very sensibly. You know, we have no um, debts apart from the money, you know, that I've put into the business. We don't borrow any money. We don't, we, we're very cautious about that because I think as soon as you start going down the route of, of funding and trying to do refund rounds and, and, and getting loans for your business, especially in a car business like Lister, I think very quickly you can come unstuck. I mean, we're seeing that with TVI now, aren't we? You know, I mean, they, they had such a fantastic launch. They had so many people behind it, so many people placed an order and nobody wanted TVI to do well more than me. Um, and I spoke to Les Edgar about it, you know, and, uh, and, and kind of because I, I could always see that the, um, the, the danger was, you know, borrowing too much, trying to get too much money together and then going out and, 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 and basically, you know, 50 million pounds or 25 million pounds down the line now, still not got a car produced. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that, that is a really dangerous position. And unfortunately, it's probably not going to go the right way, is it? Um, and, and I've been very cautious, maybe because of what Brian had said to me, not to mess the company up really, that, that we, we don't want to go down that route. You know, we want to make sure we can afford what we're doing, make sure that we can stay around for the long term. There's, I mean, one thing I loved about Lister when I bought it was it had never gone into liquidation. It had never stopped trading. I mean, it had traded from 19, Lister, the Lister Car Limited Company had traded from 54 until the present day completely unchanged. You know, and I, and I love that about it. You know, it's, um, 
there's not many small British car companies can say that. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I think that's really, really special. Yeah. But something that we, we need to, whatever we do in the future, it's going to be carefully considered and costed and made sure that when it's not going to be something that, that, that's too outrageous. And I think electric cars, listen, they're easy compared to petrol and electric, uh, you know, uh, petrol and diesel cars, you know, you, you, you the, the technology to build a car is far cheaper and far simpler to, to make work. So it, in a way, it's easier for small car companies to come out with an electric car. But I don't know, I think, I, st I still think it's, uh, it's something that for me just doesn't quite get me as excited as a, as a petrol car. But listen, I might change my opinion in the future. Yeah. Um, I do think that it, it's interesting you, you talk about TVR. You know, it has been spoken about a lot. I think, I think with 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 you, however, it's it's different because you you're, you've approached it from a from a business from a from a more of a business view. You know, after you know you've, you've got warranty wise, you obviously know how to run a successful company. Whereas with other people, you know, perhaps they get um, too wrapped up in the dream of all the, 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 ro the romance of the company. And, and unfortunately, as is the way with a lot of British sports car companies over the years, you know, there's been the dream, there's been the passion, but they've got the finances wrong and it's spiraled out of control, unfortunately. So it's yeah. an interesting... it comes down to the person, doesn't it? I mean, I think, uh, uh, you know, Lawrence Tomlinson, who runs Janetta, is far wealthier than me and he can afford to throw... 40, 50 million pounds at Janetta and not really worry too much about it. Um, you know, and, and I'm just not in that position. You know, we've got to make sure that uh, Lister is a, um, a, a company that, that wipes its face at the end of the day. And, and that's something I'm proud to have produced. I think there's, you know, one thing I love about Morgan is, you know, you, they make a fantastic product and they've, they've pretty much always been in profit. I know they've had one or two dodgy years, but they, they tend to make around 800,000 pounds a year. Now, they only make 800 cars a year, so let, let's say they make a grand a car, but it's still, it's keeping them going, isn't it? Yeah. And, um, you know, I think with, with Lister, I think that's that's one thing we want to do is be in the black, be a good, strong company. And then, you, then you're then you free then, aren't you, to press on in the future and make the company uh, last a long time rather than it being like a flash in the pan sort of thing. Um, but listen, I think... Uh, I think with TVR, I think, you know, whether we think it's good or bad, I think Les Edgar's probably been quite sensible to put other people's money into it rather than his, uh, all of his own money. Um, mm. uh, but it, let, let's just hope that they can get that funding and get the cars built because I think that's what people want to see, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think we're going to have to call time on on that, Lawrence. I'm fr I mean, I, I could carry on talking for hours about Lister, but um, I don't think our viewers will, will lose interest, actually two boring men talking about cars um <laughs> one boring man sorry one boring man um but anyway thank you so much for coming on Lawrence it's been an absolute pleasure chatting to you oh thank you James. but I kind of say that the, the, the list of stealth is going to be launched um within the next week uh, we've got a great launch video that Tiffany Dell has done for us and uh we're looking forward to uh to getting it out there and, and, and getting the car into the press's hands so that they can we've got two press cars ready to go um, so we're, we're looking forward to um, to, to launching and, uh, and hopefully getting some uh, some more orders and, uh, yeah. and selling some cars. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. So we, we have had... got to support British manufacturing. Support British manufacturing, exactly. Perfect way to end, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lawrence. Fantastic. Um, so it, it, there we are. That was Cardio Alive for this Friday. August the 7th. If you want to be on Cars Here Live, then please do email me, james.bachelor at blackballmedia.co.uk or James Baggett, james at blackballmedia.co.uk and we can have a nice chat like I've just had with Lawrence. Now, um, that's it for this week. Um, we've got a packed uh, schedule next week as well. But until then, have a lovely weekend and bye-bye. <laughs>